So Madhvi, you mentioned that your current self workouts are not giving you the result, and that's a program related situation. Like I mentioned again, that's just technicality. Why you're not doing the type of exercises that you need to be doing? That's the easiest fix, and I'll fix that for you today. But one of the things that really dawned on me as a coach is you're low on motivation. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Why are you low on motivation? What, what's what's up with that? I think trying to get started, finding the right motivation to get started itself, that I feel is a challenge. Sometimes once I get into the routine of it, it works out easier. But just getting up in the morning and then amongst all your chores, trying to figure out which is that point that you allocate yourself to get to the exercises is what I find a challenge. Okay, so let me share something with you on motivation, the science of motivation and the, and the practical approach of motivation. And I don't know if you've been taught this before. So the definition of motivation means giving yourself a reason to do something, right? That's motive. Yep. You'll probably hear, I don't have the motive, or did he have the motive to do something? Right, so here's the thing. The, the better question is, how does someone find motivation to do something that's awfully painful, like getting up, off the couch, working out, and more specifically, the types of exercises that will actually uh, boost up your metabolism, tone your legs and your arms, like push-ups and proper form with single legs. One, that's extremely painful when we, as human beings, are in a state of demotivated, which means lack of motive to work towards something. Now, the problem occurs when we say that we're aligned with getting in shape, like you said on your application, feeling good for the summer, feeling good in my clothes, because I, everybody feels great when they're in good shape because they feel more confident. Their yeah. life is better, they apply for bigger job promotions, they go find a partner or a mate, or they go out and put themselves out because they're just, I look good, I feel good. That's a, that's a science, right? But you still don't feel like actually doing the work. You want the desire, but you're not, going to go through the pain. The way to bridge that gap is not motivation. The way to bridge that gap is behavior changes. So the first behavior change is how do we set up a system, a formula that's worked for ages and ages and ages where somebody is going to be showing up to work out and that person is going to hold me accountable and that coach is going to ask me, hey, it's 6 a.m., I need you for 30 minutes. We committed to it. You've also invested in your coaching. And then you're like, okay, if I don't show up now, I've failed myself, which I'm used to failing myself, right? Think about how we train our body and our subconscious brain. We say we're going to do things, but we don't follow up on them. And what does that do to our confidence level and subconscious level? It actually retrains the subconscious level that we're failures, that we'll never end up doing what we say we are. So we come to to terms with being failures. But what if you have to show up at 6 a.m., you've invested in coaching, and I'm telling you, look, my time is valuable. I'm passionate about coaching you. You owe me to show up, or I'm not going to take you on. I'm not going to work with you. And then you're going to work out for 30 minutes. And then let's say the first day was extremely hard, but you do this for 20 weeks in a row or 14 weeks in a row, or even 10 weeks in a row, at the end of the 10 week journey, on the other end, you're gonna be like, crap. Waking up is much easier than 10 weeks ago to do my 30 minute workout, to take care of myself. And when I'm done, not only do I feel strong and fit and tone, but I actually feel mentally clear. And that clarity. So you're not looking for motivation. You're looking for a system, a formula where someone's going to hold you accountable. And that's where people go wrong. People look for motivation. No, your goals are there. You're here. Reaching for that goal in the beginning is going to require a lot of energy, just like a rocket thrusts millions and millions of pounds of energy or gas, whatever their metric is when, when rockets take off. But once it's smooth sailing, the rocket just almost works off low gas, low volume, right? Did you ever see that? So human yep. beings are the same way. We need some sort of a thrust and the coach and you committing, you're making that decision as a thrust. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I, I do see it as well when, I think it's the starting off point because you know it's going to take you a certain number of days or weeks till you start seeing results. 
because once you start seeing results, that's what triggers you all the more to keep continuing it. But traversing that journey, I think that becomes a challenge to just push yourself to do it every single day or every alternate day or whatever the, whatever the schedule that you set for yourself. Awesome. Okay, this is where I'm going to stop the recording. Before, before COVID, I used to walk to the station from the station walk to work. Okay. So my one day walk for 45 minutes, the walk back was 45 minutes. So without doing anything rigorous, I would easily get an hour and a half worth of exercise. Mm -hmm. There was a specific routine to things. So which, which made me do a lot more physical activity than I would because COVID was all working from home. Mm -hmm. Of course, the eating habits kind of went for a toss and there were more guilty pleasures in terms of eating. So I guess it was um, why COVID threw it for a toss is because the reduction in physical movement versus increase in you know the number of cheat days in terms of what you will eat mm -hmm. you know, that, kind of, that kind of went up so i guess that's why i kind of hold covid responsible okay so let me ask you something you said something like you hold covid responsible so does that mean that you give a hundred percent responsible to covid and what happened externally for the lack of your uh, or, or for the reason being of your weight gain or you're not working out and you're, you're struggling with your thoughts and your mindset and you're not taking care of your health and fitness? Is that no, what you're no, no, COVID is not responsible for it. I am responsible for it, but it was my change in routine during that period that kind of gave priority to other things. Mm -hmm. And it started becoming more difficult because, for example, if you have a regular work day, Mm -hmm. come rain come snow you are going to walk through the snow and get to work gotcha when when you have the liberty to work from home you are going to spend that much time working instead of saying hey let me go out and take a walk because the okay. weather's happy okay. anyway. fair enough fair enough let me ask you a better question okay the better question is what will you do with your body and your confidence and your health and fitness if another COVID happens or something at work um you know derails you or another project or something in your personal life you're like eh, i'm not my goals have changed i'm not motivated enough to work on myself how will you handle the same challenge that you're having with your body and your fitness and your confidence when something else like that happens again or another COVID that happens i think one good thing is these things are always there at the back of my mind so it's not like when a break takes place i forget about it in fact, keeping it in mind is a constant reminder that I have to get back to it. So I don't anticipate from now until end of life, I'm going to be this perfect person who's going to keep a routine for myself. I know there are going to be breaks, but what I want really for myself is to know how to put myself back in the discipline. So every time I get off of it, I have a plan how to get back to it, even if there's a long break. So Brilliant question. Brilliant. An answer. And you're right. Uh, everyone should have tools on how to come back out of tough, tough times, right? So here's my question. Would you be interested in not taking an on and off approach and, and being just figuring out a way to be completely consistent with your health and fitness and your confidence and feeling good? Or are you interested in knowing how to come out of a, a dump because something else happens or another COVID happens and then have the tools to get back? Because they both say two things. Once one person says, and one mindset says, the first one, that I don't let the external event control what my daily routine is going to be. If my goal damn well is to be strong and fit and the best version of myself and feel great every morning, and if that requires me to do a 15, 20-minute workout every morning because now I've got the tools to do it, I'm not going to let another COVID hurt me or another event in life hurt me. The other person mindset is I'm basically telling myself that right now it's a priority, but 10 weeks from now, or eight weeks from now, if something else happens, I'll be yo-yo down into a dump and I'll deal with another COVID or another situation for a year or two. And then I have the tools, I'll pick up that toolbox, take the rust off it, dust it off, and then say, okay, I'm ready to become confident, fit, and happy again. So there's two, two peoples, and I come across both different types of people in, in my coaching service right because that's what we do professionally so which type do you want to be so as contradictory as it may sound i i want to have both and i'll explain how i want to be the first type of person where i make it a part of my routine no matter what and i want to that's why i set a routine which is not rigorous which i know i can attain for myself 
But at the same time, I also, as a backup, need to be able to know the mechanism and tools that I need to get myself out of a slump, should a slump happen. Because while I aim to be the first kind of person, I don't deny that I might not be perfect at it. So I need to have that mechanism to come back to it whenever the need arises. Yeah, that's basically saying you would aspire to be that person, you want to be that person, but you're self-aware enough that I might not be that person. Yep. Yep, right. exactly. Yep. And self-awareness to me is much better than saying, oh, no, no, I will be that person. I am. But then you realize that you set yourself up with the wrong program. It's not sustainable. You haven't really built the right tools. Sustainability in itself is a tool and discipline that you have to understand how to build, right? Because yep. we only need something that's sustainable if we're going to do life as a marathon versus life as a sprint, right? So good. Okay. So let's jot that down. We're going to talk about the sustainability goal as well and give you a program for that. If you're a beginner, there is no way you should be doing the regular push-up that you see everywhere, which is this, okay? Because you don't have the strength for it. Most likely, most beginners do this. They start off over here, they're arching their back, and they do this. Hmm. Right? So that's not a push-up. What they're really doing is saying to me is teach me what I'm supposed to do, right? So there's something called building blocks, right? Building block basically means that we're gonna take an average beginner, we're gonna put their hands right next to their chest on their yoga mat, maybe done in the gym or at home, cross their legs, and they're gonna compartmentalize in two steps. Step one. And step two. But did you notice that my core and my pelvis or a line, yeah. right? I don't want it to look like this. Okay? I want it to look like this, with the core and the pelvis like this. Step one, step two. And your knees are touching the ground, right? Yes, on the floor, you can see it. And the benefit of that push-up is, it's actually gonna train your arms, your pecs, which is known, known as your chest muscles, as you know, your shoulder muscles, and I always stabilize my core. Did you see that? I wasn't arching my lower back. My core was completely aligned. Eventually, what ends up happening in coaching is our students end up doing these more and more week one, week four, week five, and then eventually, whenever someone's supposed to, their body will naturally adjust, they will one day end up doing this. Right, and they'll be super surprised that within eight weeks, they're able to do that in a short time where they've never been able to do it. So let's try it. Thank you. Okay, so anytime a female student or a client of ours has um, um, a, let's give it a term, mommy belly, okay? Or mommy tummy. Uh, B, a C-section, and that's a tough thing because I've got family members that have had C-sections, very tough thing. Or C, diastasized recti, and I'm sure you know that where the abdominal walls open up very intense or very careful to close it back. And even men have that problem where like huge bodybuilders, their walls are separated. So I'm actually gonna show you a couple of things which anyone can do. This, this is, you can do this while sitting at your desk working um, all day long because it's, it's more of a technique and an approach thing versus, oh, give me that five minute secret because there's no, five minute secret to getting a flat stomach. But I think we know that by now. So here's what I'm, we're gonna do. First thing, everybody should understand that your superficial muscle, the six pack, right? Which you, everybody wants that because that's the most superficial, it's more, it's more visible, is in charge of a few things in your anatomy, right? One is flexion, the other one is extension and a few other things. But when you do flexion, you're basically training your, your stomach to open up, right? And what does that do for me? It trains my anatomy to be bigger in my waist, right? So you have to actually train another muscle called your TVA, your transverse uh, versus abdominus, your transverse abdominus, right? That's the right way to say it. Transverse abdominus. So it's in charge. It's in charge of training your body like a um, a corset. You know, a corset. If you remember those 1950s or 40s, 
the corset was designed to bring in the waist. So the first thing to do is keep your legs up in the tabletop and train the waist muscles, the corset muscles to draw the belly in and close up, which is what I call like this. Okay, so what I've done is I've come up with my shoulder blades off the mat. I'm engaging the corset muscles. The function of that is to close in. And then I'm practicing my navel, which is right here, is to be closer to the mat. Okay. And then I'm just going to do this. All in all, I'm thinking that my corset is drawn in and I'm just engaging from here first. Because if I don't think that way, and the alternative is this. Okay, so what am I using? I'm using my hip flexors, I'm using my lower back, I'm using my neck, I'm using momentum, and I'm opening up the belly. So the whole concept is to actually be aware and mentally draw the waist in, hold it in while you do the other exercises and connect the brain to the pelvic floor and the TBA muscle. Does that make sense? Yes, just one question. Mm -hmm. As you do that exercise, how do you breathe? When you are coming up, do you breathe out or breathe in? And when you go down, what do you do? Okay, so good question. The way you're meant to be breath is some, uh, breathe is something I learned from martial arts, right? So a long time ago, I was a high level competitive martial arts in a black belt, and I'm still, I still hold that, that degree. So the way we were taught, and the, which is the way I'm gonna coach you on how to breathe. You ever realize any time you exhale, you're actually contracting your belly? Did you ever realize that? Yeah. Any time you watch, watch this, because I've had a ton of water and coffee today, I'm gonna to inhale and you expand the abdomen belly when you inhale, right? So contraction is where you actually <sighs> exhale. And contraction is where you actually get that powerful. <sighs> See that, like the whole thing, you're contracting. So you actually have to do it then. So I'm gonna actually coach you on how to do it, okay? You see the entire area. The dark red on the, on the sides and then the light pink mm. in the front. That entire area is the largest area in your abdominal cavity. Basically, it has the superficial muscle called the six pack in there. It's got the transverse versus abdominal muscle that I taught you, which is a corset. You see, it's going to be trained to come in. It has those muscles that are required to move you side to side. It has everything. Now, when you learn to engage your core, and you actually train to do a proper plank or the, um, the pelvic connection to the floor exercise I just taught you on the tabletop um, that I was giving you a tutorial about, or even a proper push up or even a proper lunge. If you can learn to engage your core muscles, it's gonna work the entire region. So the question where you asked me, will it work the lower abdomen region? It's gonna work the entire region. Now, I think because um, this is a very common question, I think the question you might be trying to ask me is, will I lose body fat in my lower belly? Maybe that's a better question you were trying to ask me. So the answer number one, yes, it's everything's going to work your uh, entire region as long as you understand how to connect your mind to the core and actually hold it in and stable and work, work with it, whatever words you really want to use. I think the better question is, what's it going to take to lose the belly fat in your lower belly, which is the most stubborn area? We're going to get to that as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Super slow. The whole job objective is to connect the waist muscles, the TVA muscle, the corset analogy, while the lower back uh, low, while the belly button is actually pushed through the lower back into the mat, you have to connect first. 